Okay, we'll continue with chapter three talking about national income with lecture number two. In this lecture, we're going to begin looking at the supply side of our model by analyzing something called the production function. So we're going to do some basic review, and this is probably something you are familiar from from principles of macroeconomics. But we're going to split the economy up into two different factors of production. Okay, and we're going to kind of glob everything together. We have both capital, which are tools, machinery, structures used, basically the stuff businesses use to make stuff. And then labor, the physical and mental efforts of workers. Now you might look at this and say, wow, wait a minute, that's just this huge assumption. We're assuming there's one kind of capital or that there's one aggregate that we can come up with that measures capital that will explain all the capital in the economy, right? Yeah, okay, that's a big assumption. You're probably right. Uh, but for this model, we're going to keep things simple. And the real reason for that is, well, you kind of have to crawl before you can run. And I think you'll see by the time we get through the course that, well, our models get complicated enough as it is to begin with without adding lots and lots of realism. So we're going to keep it very simple. And so this is a major simplifying assumption, just one type of capital, essentially. And then we're not differentiating amongst labor. So there's a bit of a difference between, well, say a college graduate with a major in economics and a high school dropout. All right? There's different levels of labor and different levels of ability. For example, um, if I'm going to try to use my labor to uh, play professional football, well, that's not going to go so well for me. I'm going to last exactly, oh, about, oh, I could probably make it through the stretches in uh, the workout of a professional um, team, maybe, without injuring myself. But that's probably about the limit. Uh, so my labor is clearly not the same as a professional football player, but then again, maybe he wouldn't, a professional football player might not do so well at teaching macroeconomics. Who knows? In any event, we're not making differentiations amongst labor. There's only one type of labor. We call that labor. Is that a big assumption? You betcha. Is it realistic? No. Is it a good assumption? Well, probably not. But it works very well uh, for the model that we're looking at. And overall, when we'll get done, we're going to have a model that actually the predictions are, are pretty good as far as predicting what actually happens in the real world. So overall, it's not that horrible a model. And it serves as a foundation for all the much more complicated, fancier, cooler models we'll have later. So this is our first really, really important simplifying assumption. We have two inputs, capital and labor. Once we've made our assumption that we have capital and labor, now we need to talk about something called the production function. All right, the production function. And what does the production function do? It shows us the maximum amount of output we can get from a certain combination of inputs. Okay, and, and it's really important to realize this. This definition that I have up here isn't quite right. It really should say, it should show us the max output the economy can produce from given amounts of capital and labor, given amounts of our input. And why is that? Well, let's say with 10 units of capital and 10 units of labor, I can produce 10 units of output. Could I not also produce 5? Sure. I produce 10 units and I throw 5 away. Oh, I just produced 5. But you say, well, that sounds kind of silly. Well, it probably is silly. But there are silly possibilities, right? So the production function gives us the non-silly possibilities, the maximum output that the economy can produce from a given combination of capital and labor. It also reflects what economists call the economy's technology. Now, we have to take a step back and remember, what does the word technology mean? So when you think of technology, probably the first thing that comes to your mind is a computer or an iPad or a cell phone, right? You know, these smartphones. We got all this technology around us and more and more so all the time. But really what the word technology means is the application of knowledge, putting knowledge to work. And so what an economist means when he says technology is the processes by which we take inputs and turn them into outputs. So really it's this overall process of how inputs become outputs.
and a technological improvement allows us to make more stuff with the same amount of output or I'm sorry with the same amount of input so more output with the same amount of inputs same amount of capital same amount of labor with more output gives us an increase in technology and if you want to look at a really really concrete example of that look at the agricultural industry throughout the United States if you think about agriculture in say um, 1913 right 100 years ago well what would it look like well you'd have very small farms um, with with very small tractors if there are any tractors mostly it's going to be done with animals so horses pulling plows and all the stuff done by hand fast forward to today how do we do it ginormous tractors um, plowing lots of fields doing lots of stuff lots of automation lots of technology involved we can produce a whole lot more food with essentially the same amount of inputs that we did back then right why because of technological advancement so a very very important assumption that we're going to make all right and I'm gonna circle this remember this this is important we are going to make this assumption throughout the semester we are going to assume that our production functions exhibit constant returns to scale now I don't know if you remember constant returns to scale from principles or micro or not but it's very important I'm not going to go through the definition of constant returns to scale right now because there is a review um, lecture uh, in the in the um, on the course website that will go through constant returns to scale increasing returns to scale decreasing returns to scale if you don't remember this concept go through that uh, video it's very very important because we're going to come back to this over and over and over again because constant returns to scale well let's just say it makes the math so much easier um, that we can actually do it in this class so we're going to continue to assume constant returns to scale now the next question you might ask is well is constant returns to scale and the basic definition is this if I increase all of my outputs by a factor or I'm sorry if I increase all of my inputs by a certain factor say I increase capital by 10 percent I increase labor by 10 percent if I have constant returns to scale I'll increase output by 10 percent by the exact same factor double capital double labor how much additional output will I have double okay now if you that, that doesn't make sense and that isn't enough of a review for you go find the review videos it's very important you do that notice I even put a little warning here yeah that's important okay so we have this very very special functional form called the Cobb Douglas production function now the Cobb Douglas production function may or may not be that realistic as far as what really describes how the economy works but it has a lot of very nice properties it's a very famous um, functional form that well everybody has to learn to begin with so let me go ahead and write out the Cobb Douglas production function and then I want to talk about each of its parts so in the Cobb Douglas production function we have output equals alright first of all this function of capital and labor so that's our beginning step remember we said that we've got two inputs capital and labor but that doesn't do as much good that's just an arbitrary function that could be anything right and oh and there's tons of them you know you know there's CES functions Cobb Douglas production functions you know another you know more exotic weirder cooler ones but we're gonna focus in on the produ Cobb Douglas production function because well it works just fine for our um, you know pedagogical purposes learning this stuff and um, it has some neat properties so the first step is oh, let's write this so it's going to be we're going to have a constant a times capital to the alpha times labor to the one minus alpha okay now I want to go through each one of those parts that's what we call the basic form of the Cobb Douglas production function now so what's this a a is a measure of technology right? or another way of thinking about it is it's the overall factor productivity alright so if a goes up then the productivity of well everything goes up 
Okay, and and that's that's this technological advancement. That's why we kind of think of it as that technological advancement. Now we've talked about what K and L are. K is the level of capital in the economy. L is the level of output in the economy. But the next thing that's really important is these these subscripts, or, or I'm sorry, these superscripts, these um, exponents. All right, what's going on with these? Well. There's a couple of things going on with the Cobb-Douglas production function. These actually have the interpretation of being the income share to capital and the income share to labor when we have constant returns to scale. But for right this second, just think of these as a parameter of the model. That's just what it is. And there's a, a very important thing to note about them. Notice that, well, alpha plus 1 minus alpha equals what? That equals 1. Well, an important characteristic of the Cobb-Douglas production function is that if these exponents on the capital and labor sum up to 1, then we have constant returns to scale. Very important when we were assuming constant returns to scale throughout the semester, right? Well, these two coefficient, these two um, exponents will always need to sum to one. A couple other things that we're going to talk about, and you're going to have to remember a little bit of calculus. Okay, uh, so if you don't remember your calculus or you need a little bit of a refresher course, there's review videos that talk about that. So they'll talk a little bit about differentiation. You'll need to know how to take the derivative, and you're going to need to know how to find the maximum of a function. And so I have some review videos link to on the course webpage that will give you background on both of those. So for right now that gives us our Cobb-Douglas production function, this basic form. So let's keep going. So I talked about needing to take the derivative. Well, that's important because what is the marginal product of capital or the marginal product of labor? So we define that right here. This MPK, we're going to call that the marginal product of labor or I'm sorry, marginal product capital, MPK. Okay. How do I find that? Well, I take the derivative, the partial derivative of the production function with respect to K. In other words, it looks something like this. The partial total output, the production function, with respect to K. All right, and, and the way to do that is just the power rule. So you bring, remember you bring the um, coefficient down in front, and then you raise the variable to the coefficient, or the um, you bring the exponent down in front, and then you raise the variable to the exponent minus one. That's the power rule. Okay, and so that just equals that right up there. If you need some help at, of going through that and figuring that, just let me know, and we'll we'll talk offline. All right, next, we can do the exact same thing with the marginal product of labor. And, and that's what the, de the derivative is going to look like. On your own, I suggest you take that Cobb-Douglas production function, okay, and uh, go ahead and try to solve for these two derivatives. So here's something else that's important to note. When we draw this out, and if I look at this, take, for example, marginal product of capital. Well, I could rewrite that. Let me go back here and let me clear that. I could rewrite this guy in a little bit easier to see form that looks like something like this. Alpha times A, those are just constants out in front. L over K to the one minus alpha. Now, why would I do that? Well, notice right here, this is alpha minus 1. Well, that's the same thing as negative 1 times 1 minus alpha. And whenever I have a negative exponent, that just kicks whatever I'm raising it to that power, the base of that, down to the denominator. So that's all I did. And then they both have the same exponents. Now notice, 1 minus alpha has to be positive because alpha all right, must be within 0 and 1. Now, I know I just used some funky notation, right? 
This means alpha is an element of the interval 0 to 1. In other words, it has to be greater than or equal to 0 or less than or equal to 1. And frankly, if it's 0, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And if it's 1, it well doesn't make a lot of sense. So it really kind of needs to be in between those two. But for right now, we know alpha is going to be less than 1. So that this, this here is positive. So we know that capital is down here in the denominator. What does that mean? That means when capital gets bigger, what happens to marginal product capital? It gets smaller. So K goes up, MPK goes down. Okay, so what do we see here? This exactly, exactly that. As MPK is going up, and what we've done is we've just drawn the production function here in terms of K. So we've held labor constant, and we're changing K. And notice I made a little mistake here. Sorry about that. That should be M P K. Okay. The slope of the of this function, oh, and all of these guys, pardon me, should all be M P K. All right, K, 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 there we go. They should all be marginal product of capital, because that's what we're talking about here. All right. As we increase the amount of capital, how much additional output we get for one more unit of capital? Well, that diminishes. So here's the thing. Even when we have constant returns to scale, all right, so if I increased capital and increased labor both by the same amount, I would increase output by whatever amount I increase those two, right? Constant returns to scale. I can still have diminishing returns to a particular um, factor of production or the marginal product of capital, marginal product of labor are diminishing. And that concludes our discussion of the production function.